Welcome back to another tutorial on Sequence Generator Pro. This is the first clear night of any duration that I've had for many weeks, hence the pause in the number of videos being posted online. I thought I would try and show you a couple of other features of Sequence Generator Pro and its general operation, basically tips and tricks. The guiding that I'm doing at the moment is on a very short focal length telescope. So whilst the guiding graph looks absolutely brilliant in terms of pixels, it actually is quite a large scale. So for instance, if I change the settings to arc seconds, you can see that it's basically plus or minus one arc second, which is okay, but not great. Uh, one of the reasons being at the moment it's quite windy. But if I just set that back to pixels, um, then it'll mimic the graph that's being shown here in Sequence Generator Pro. And that's doing three second exposures. And as you can see, there are positive and negative corrections every few samples. So it's, it's doing a reasonable job. So I'm just going to minimize that for a second and concentrate on what we would do in the middle of a sequence. So at the moment, I'm using a color camera, a CMOS camera, with a narrowband filter on it. And it's picking out the faint outlines of the heart nebula and the Sol Nebula over here. And I just wanted to show you a couple of tips and tricks that you can use along the way to identify problems and prevent them happening. So for instance, if you enable the image history, you get a trace of the number of stars that it's detecting and the half flux radius, which is the size of the stars. And you can see that there's a couple of anomalies here where it seems to have got um, a lot worse. And if you just move your cursor till it comes up like that and then click on it, double click even, oh, no, single click, you can see in that particular case I had an aeroplane going over which was the cause of the alteration of the half flux radius. If I actually look in at the stars at 200% you can see they're, they're small dots. And similarly on this one here, if I click on this one, you think well there's nothing wrong with that image, but if I zoom in you can see that the stars have come little streaks and I had a problem with the guiding at that point. Um, the uh, guide camera had worked loose in its mounting and it was flopping about. So this is quite a, a useful health check as you go along in a sequence. And if you see a gradual trend of the half flux radius changing dramatically, it can be caused by temperature fluctuations or focus tube slippage. But the difference between the half flux radius of 2.91 there and 3.72 is, oh, that's the odd, odd one. Let's look at the one like here, 3.11. That's a pretty small difference, and it's probably due to guiding anomalies between the two exposures, each of which here is 20 minutes long, so it's quite a, a lengthy exposure. So there's a couple other things that you can do. For instance, on the guiding graph, if you click on it, you get different scales. If you notice, there's faint white lines going across the screen, depending on your pixel scale. Um, you can also clear the graph or you can show more or less samples. So for instance, if I look at uh, 250, you can see there's a, a blip there and that's the dither command which is put in in between two exposures. I normally leave it on about 100. And that's very similar to the controls in PHD2 where you can change the number of samples on the screen. This isn't the number of seconds but the number of samples. So. Let's just minimize that for a second. A couple other things just to watch out for. In your sequence itself, sometimes you want a sequence to run on into another target. So for instance, if I pick up the Sky X and look at the planetarium, my telescope is a few hours away from hitting the horizon. So rather than waste the night, I'd like to do something else. So in the sequencer, I've added another target. At the moment it's doing the heart and soul and if I look at the planning tools that will finish at around half past ten at an altitude of 40 degrees which is typically a, a reasonable altitude to end uh, long exposures on due to seeing noise and such. So if I just come out of that for a second and then look at this one what I want this to do is to continue on. And now this is on the other side of the meridian and it doesn't need a start time because it will start as soon as the other one finishes. And again, on the planning tools, you see there's no start time here. But by the time it gets to 
half past 10, it's over 40 degrees, and it will carry on going to about five o'clock tomorrow morning. So that's quite a useful thing to do if you've got make the most of a, a, a clear night and one of your targets is going to set early is put that at the top of the sequence and change the other one to start as soon as the one finishes. Now the other thing just to watch out for is that I know tonight the forecast is suggesting I'm going to get cloud at about three to four o'clock and this little button here it's not particularly the most obvious button but it brings up the sequence settings and so for instance here it says disconnect all equipment at sequence end and end sequence at about half past four. So give or take half an hour because forecasts are never quite exact. I don't really want to deliberately run the sequence into a cloud structure with um, the chance of snow which we've had earlier today. So that's quite useful to do. And another couple of things I want to show you is I'm going to deliberately invent a, a dummy sequence which is not going to be real in this case. If I was sequencing all night it's sometimes best, especially if you're starting at low altitude, to choose a red filter at the, at the beginning of the, of the night and then go on to a green filter and then maybe a blue filter as the altitude increases because the red light is less affected by atmospheric refraction and therefore seeing conditions. Now maybe you want in all cases, maybe you want to do 50 exposures of each. But the reality is I don't really want to do 50 exposures because if by the time I've done 50, say for instance, 10 minute exposures, I'll have used up the whole night. So sometimes what you really want it to do is a bunch of reds, then greens and blues, and then on a subsequent night do the same again. So what you typically do is at the beginning you might only put down 20 uh, on each of them and then run that for the night and it'll, it'll end after the blues uh, at a suitable time in the morning and then when you reopen the sequence on the following day or whenever it's clear again you would increase this to 40 samples and, and, and so forth. So with finish entire events first. So you can bring it up in steps of maybe t tens or twenties to fill out the best times to image certain types of, of filters. So for instance in conditions where the moon is quite bright and I'm trying to image dim nebulosity I'll typically start off with my hydrogen alpha and sulfur narrowband filters which are fairly immune to light pollution and moonlight and then when the moon goes over and it, or it starts rising much later then I will start to enable um, later sequences, um, or later events I should say, disable the first couple and then re-enable these ones and start doing say red, green and blue which are more susceptible to light pollution. So for instance you can you can tune your sequences dynamically. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily do it while they're running but certainly you can do it while they're paused um, or it's running a different um, target in, in your overall sequence. And that way you make the most of every night and get the highest quality. Because the thing to remember about light pollution is while you can delete the orange mush um, that often fills the sky, deleting the orange mush leaves behind the shot noise that comes with the light. So it's much better to exclude the light pollution even if you're using say a luminance filter. I often use a special filter which reduces the light pollution. It's basically clear but takes out the three principal light pollution wavelengths. And while it doesn't make a dramatic difference to the appearance when you first look at it, what you do notice is it has a much better image noise level because it's removed the shot noise associated with the light pollution background level. So there's a couple of little tips um, to try out. One of the reasons I haven't followed up on the PhD2 um, part three um, is because my mount is very good at guiding and I'm actually waiting now to use a much cheaper um, mount that has uh, some problems and I want to be able to show how to overcome the problems but for a mount that has no backlash and has very low periodic error the only problem I'm really overcoming is polar alignment which is fairly straightforward and it's very easy to guide so I'm not going to be very instructive in using that particular mount to describe 
advanced problem solving in guiding. So a couple other little things. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how to set up the safety conditions so that you image when the conditions are good. And there are a number of ASCOM safety monitors that are provided free with an ASCOM download. And in my sequence, when I look down here, I have the ASCOM OK to image safety monitor here. But in my um, observatory controller, which I wrote myself, I have a slightly different one. And I use the OK to open safety monitor. So I have two sets of thresholds. One when it's safe to actually physically open the roof of the observatory, which really means it's dry. And the other one, OK to image, is more sensitive to cloud levels. So I can open the roof, but not necessarily be good to image. And so the idea is, is that if Sequence Generator Pro is running a sequence and the clouds start to build up, but it hasn't started raining yet, Sequence Generator Pro should shut down the system and close the roof. But failing that, if there's any chance of actual physical rain or highly overcast, then a separate monitor on my observatory shuts it down as a second tier, as it were. So that's just something to consider when you're, you're looking at things like that. There's a couple other little ones that are dotted around. So if you look under Tools and Options, your file naming, default file naming process is defined here. And that can help you identify files quickly when you're trying to match up darks, flats, lights, and so on. Also, things like auto stretch levels and the, the normal way of finding stars can be defined here. The, um, the sequence options typically are about recovery and delays, but these can be overridden, um, especially around the sequence order. So, for instance, I've got a roll-off roof, which is fairly easy to open and close. My mount controller makes sure that the roof doesn't open and close while the mount is in an unsafe position but it does allow me to restart the sequence when the conditions are safe. So if you are using an environment monitor, either through ASCOM or, or whatever, and it says, yes, the conditions are good again, and you've got this option ticked, Sequence Gener Generator Pro will try and restart the sequence as if it was starting from scratch again. And that's quite useful for making the most of a night, especially when you've gone to bed and it clouds up um, after you've gone to sleep. And you can attempt recovery um, over a period of time and you can tell it how often to try and over what period. Typically, um, if it's a rogue cloud, um, I've, I've chosen about one and a half hours um, and after which it's going to give up. But that's quite easy to, to move around. And the other thing that I didn't mention in the earlier videos is about notifications. So um, this is a, a pop-up system that pops up here. Let me just shut that down for a second. So these used to, on, on earlier versions, come across the screen and would then slowly fade away, which, if you're taking lots of short exposures, could be quite intrusive. But this gives you a, a quick visual record of what it's been doing, if there's been any issues, and just general information. And you can select what comes up as a notification with these options here. So at the moment, I have it on alerts, warnings, and errors. Um, and there are other notification systems like uh, the Good Night system from Lunatico that come up on an iPhone and ping you if there's something of a problem. And this little button here saying external apps, this just is a, a way of telling Sequence Generator Pro where some of your third party programs are, for instance, PhD2 Guiding uh, and the Pinpoint Astrometric Catalog. And here is the, the last one, which is ASTAP, which is the latest, and I think an extremely good, plate solver, which is another freebie, in addition to Elbrus and plate solver too. So again, you can load your catalogues and it knows where to find what the path name is. Just a couple of little things. I can hide that by hitting that button there, and away it goes. And you can see how far through the sequence you are, so I'm quite a long way off. And there's a couple of other little dialogues which we haven't looked at, which could be useful. There's one on targets. So for instance, you can set a focus target or a target position. So for instance, if you're generally imaging a certain area, 
you can set a target position, say go to target. Um, and you can also, if you, for instance, trying to focus on a globular cluster, which is quite tricky, you can actually have a, a focus target and you can set that up and you just say go to focus, hit an autofocus button and so forth. That isn't really used as much as it used to be, but I think in future editions of SGP that may start to be brought into play because all it needs is a link between the focus settings to use the focus target on an autofocus run and then it can use the target for the focusing. So for instance, in the case of a, a bright nebula or a large galaxy, it's sometimes better just to move the focus position away to just a normal star field. So I think I'll end it there. Uh, that's quite a, a lengthy video of, of, of random things which can be useful. And I hope that helps. And hopefully when I get my cheat mount, it will have some, but not too severe I hope, uh, issues which I can then show you how to guide out. Thanks for watching.